Well, good morning, everyone, and I'm really glad to have you on board. This is a, going to be a fascinating ride. Um, I've, if I was to give this talk a bit of a nickname, it would be Fires and Firefighters 360, because we're going to look at it from every point of view. Um, I'm very hopeful that we'll have different types of people in the audience, um, people who are interested in their family history, we've got you covered. Um, if you're a person who's more interested in the history of the fires and firefighting, we've got you covered as well. And if you're just the, the curious or the fascinated, I think we've got you covered as well. So let's have a look, let's dive in. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait people on the peoples today. So I gave you a bit of an opening um, blurb, but this is the this is how I broke down the talk. It's going to look at every angle. We're going to start with the early uh, records of fire. What the, if you're into that real early period? Um, what happens? How to find firefighters? That will settle cater for the family historians in particular. How to find major fires, city fires, and fire inquests. And then we're going to finish with um, bushfires and also photographs. So let's dive into the main talk. The early, if you were to look for some early activity around fire, the first place to always look is the Colonial Secretary's indexes, because these are letters, they're all reports that were sent to the Colonial Secretary, which is essentially sending it to the governor, to the government and the governor. And therefore, if there's going to be activity on fire, it'll be in the Colonial Secretary's indexes. And we're also going to look at the bench of magistrates, because if you have fire, you are inevitably going to also have arson. So this is what you do, and I, and I want you to, to focus on the methods here because I'm showing you exactly how to do it. And all the techniques that I'm showing you today's talk um, will work with any topic and we'll just use different keywords, you can get different results. I'm going to go to online indexes in the quick links, dive in, Colonial Secretary, and there's a number of options, but the one that I'm interested in is looking at that early period, 1788 to 1825, we dive in. And this is how the index looks. Now you can get these results on the main screen um, because they will filter through to searching all the indexes and give you the results. But if you want to condense sort of only what I'm looking for view, um, this is a way to do it. Now if you search by the keyword fire, it's going to bring forward the, all the right things but mixed in with firearms. So not, a, not an issue, just something to keep in mind. Key, the use of keywords is the really the best way to work with our systems to think of the right keyword and today's topic, fire, is perfect because it isn't used in lots of different um, types of records with the exception of firearms. Now this one I've picked out, it's William Howe, A Fire in His Barn. Okay, seems like a nice good one for today's example. It's in 19, the 11th, 1823. Now something that I noticed um, when I was preparing is that he was actually in a conflict with Brisbane and, with, and he was working with Judge Advocate Wieldy in 1822. Now this is going to be important, so I just thought I'd mention it before we jump into the actual record. If you click on details, you go through to what we call the item page, and this will then lead you to other options. Now you've, I'll show you different sorts of information on these pages through the whole webinar, but now I'm going to focus on that thumbnail. Click on the thumbnail to see the image. Now this is William Howe on the left. I couldn't resist giving you a bit of an idea of the person writing the letter. And when we zoom in, and I'm going to do a little transcriptions so we can we can really value the records that we're finding. That, that a fire was discovered on the night of the 12th of November about the hour of 11 o'clock in the barn contiguous to the cottage of William Howe Esquire. Now this is the interesting bit. There is strong reason to believe that the same was willfully and maliciously occasioned by some person or persons unknown. So we've essentially got a bit of a mystery here. There's a conflict going on with William Howe, which I won't dive into for today's webinar because it's not the fire topic. It's the, we're moving into crime if I go too far that way. But there's a conflict going on and now his barn burns down. So the, the logical thing to look at would be the criminal court indexes and the keyword to use would be arson. Now this is a results for arson. And as you can see, you can see lots of different records that you can also access if you go down the list. Now I did have a good look for William Howe in these records and it turns out that he wasn't. So that means person or persons unknown is still at large. Even though it's been a long time, I, that was an intentional pun. 
Um, now we're going to have a look at the court's records where we do get an outcome. The earlier period is the Bench of Magistrates Index, 1788 to 1820. I'll have a look at that one now. And I'm going to put in for someone that I've, which is the keyword fire, and we get four results. We'll click on the first one. Takes us through to the item page, but notice this time there is no there is no um, thumbnail at the top, which means this image is not scanned at this time. Things change all the time. This person's you know, under suspicion of setting fire to the church. Now, if we look at the item number, it gives us the actual box that the letter is kept in in the archive, which is a good thing to know if you're citing the record in your research. It also tells me and us that it's on reel 655 and COD 77. Now the reels are microfilm plastic rolls that are in the reading room and work on our readers quite easily to then um, be scanned at, at a very high resolution onto USB stick or just printed off if that's all your interest. The CODs used to be very, very fashionable, but they're essentially photocopies of the, of the, the reel and they're held in the reading room as published books. Um, my personal observation only by experience is the reel gives you a much crisper image but the book works perfectly well just to find things out. Now this is an example from that record and it gives you an example of the sort of things you can find in when you start diving into records of detail. No circumstances sufficiently strong appearing against him to substantiate the charges he was reprimanded and discharged. So if you were going down the line of researching this particular angle, it turns out that they decided to let him go because there wasn't enough evidence and we have an outcome. Mind you, he does say reprimanded discharge, so I actually just uh, might have to amend that comment. He, if he's reprimanded, they saw some some uh, naughtiness in him. I'll leave it at that for the, dis for the purposes of this webinar. Now, from the mid 19th century, uh, Sydney's fire protection was provided by volunteer and insurance company brigades. The first brigade to reach the scene extinguished the fire, and the property owners were obliged to pay for its services. I wonder if anyone can think of an issue that might come because of that. Now this is an example of the St Mary's Cathedral um, from our own collection and our government printing office records. And this is not the current St Mary's Cathedral, it's the one that burned down in the 1800s. Now if you wanted to research something that isn't necessarily in our collection or you've or you, you want to search it in, in as well as looking in our collection, that's a very good way to do it. Um, Trove is the way to go. You can see the link on the top left hand side and it's essentially it's a database for anything. You can study, you can research books on a subject, um, newspaper articles is what I'm using today and also other things, diaries, uh, music and it's quite an image, it's quite expansive and it's a very powerful resource. Now what's useful for us and any topic that's similar to this one today is you can search by subject. I've reused all of these words search all of those references are for the right fire. Now we're going to look at this one just for the sake of um, getting to an outcome. That's an image from our collection which is the, the building after the fire. Now in the article it tells me that it was destroyed by fire, that it was discovered on fire, the flames spread rapidly and a few moments covered the, the building. And it also gives me the valuation of the property that it was £200,000 which should be quite a lot of money today. Now this gives you a lot of information. Something I've always felt by observation is that before the era of TV, people had more detail when they read newspaper articles and certainly there was a wider range of coverage of the newspaper articles because TV has taken the role of general entertain news entertainment and so it's a different world today and possibly changing even more with the internet. Now this is an interesting turning point in Australian Fire Brigade's history. It's the Prince of Wales theatre and what we had on the 15th of January 1872 was an incident. So I'll take you through by reading just little snippets, it's a fascinating story, you're going to like it. The late fire at the Prince of Wales Theatre has been the scene of another series of rows and theatres commingled with the foulest language playing their stream of water at their rivals. You see what seems to have happened here, you can see that there's a big crowd gathering, the insurance companies were competing for that pay off at the end of the fire when they put out the fire. So at some point someone somewhere got frustrated, they turned their hoses onto each other. And I can, you can only imagine the outcome, those hoses have a lot of power. 
we'll go down the um, the article. It, it gets a little bit more detailed a little further on. Truly, we are degenerating into the old Yankee volunteer style when it was usual to knock off at the fire and have a good fire cutting hoses, smashing engines and various other sports. In the first place, we must have a chief of fire brigades or fire marshal appointed and authorised by the government to have full power and supreme control over police and fire brigades. I think this is one of the most fascinating newspaper articles I've ever read on Australian history because that was the day that the fire brigades fought against each other. Um, so something had to change. And so the next thing to address is an act of parliament. Now, when you're talking to archivists and they're guiding you through records, we actually look at our acts of parliament. I wouldn't say regularly, but we were aware of them. And when necessary, we look at them in incredible detail because acts of parliament will tell you what kinds of records should exist. So in this case, I won't take you through the whole act, but you can see that there's going to be a fire brigades board created. This is act is in 1984, that an appointment of a superintendent of fire brigades and insurance brigades are going to be monitored. So I think this act is addressing that newspaper article from a few years before. Volunteer fire brigades will be registered. So now we're talking state archives because if they're to be registered, where are those records? And the answer is yes, there's a lot of them here. So for acts of parliament, you would go to legislation.newsouthwales.gov.au and don't forget to click as made because that is how the records were actually published. Um, when you're doing historical research, if you don't click as made, you're searching current legislation only, which is gonna defeat your purpose. But moving on to the next point. So we have the fire brigades board. Now we have a, an agency description page here. I, for the historians and the fascinated of the audience, I strongly recommend that you look at the, from the agency descriptions. I always plug them in my webinars. They're always worth um, reading. On some subjects, they're more vital than others. And I would regard this perhaps as one of those ones. To give you a few examples, if you look down the page on this particular description, it gives you a list of all the volunteer companies. And I think that is, there's no better way for me to show you the hard work that goes on behind the scenes in an archive than the level of detail they're willing to put into these agency descriptions. So for today, I strongly recommend that you read them if you want to look at the history of these things or to work out the context or just for a bit of fun. They're well worth the read. They're highly researched, they're footnoted, and they give you that context of why those records exist. Now, if you go down to the listing at the bottom of the agency description, this is something I really would encourage all of you to start thinking about when you're looking at subjects that are not well indexed. And that is you look for something like see all series. Now, if I click on that, I'm then moving into the department of, I see every record we have for that particular department, unless it was recently transferred. And in a subject such as this one, I would be, um, I don't think there are any recently transferred records. It's a very old series, so we've got everything. I didn't make the list on this occasion, but I'll let that be homework. How's that sound? So we'll move forward and we're now going to look at finding records about firefighters. And this is going to be the family historians part. Wake up family historians, you're on. So the first thing to always check when it comes to these sorts of records is what is the access direction? And in our, our um, access directions, it says 50 years from last uh, action. Now the records we have are safely in the open period. That's not going to impact on us at all. Um, but it does mean that anything transferred in the last 50 years will be closed to public access unless you get direct permission from fire and rescue in the modern fire and rescue um, department. I'm not aware of any modern ones. I just realized I might have indicated we have them. I don't know. I didn't look into that angle because it's not part of the webinar. Now the, for this, I'm going to go to research A to Z. And in research A to Z, I'm going to go F for firefighters firefighters and then firefighters guide. Now the reason I'm, I'm taking time to show you this is that even though there's there, there's a wide variety of records when it comes to um, firefighters, it's I would call it a very, very bits and pieces um, type of record because you've got this, you've got this, you've got this, you've got like a list. Um, some record there's only, some subjects there's only one type of record, maybe two, um, but on this there's many. And so I do recommend you look at the guide click on more to see it. And then on this list, on this page, you get everything you need. Yes, I do suggest reading historical overviews. That's probably the shortest and easiest. It's better than the act. It sums up the act 
it's better than the uh, agency overview, it sums up the agency overview. So for those of you who were a little scared at what I said before, you've got it again and it's more condensed and probably more useful to the average person. The first series to note is that we've got personal record books, we're going to look at that in detail and it covers the period 1884 to 1955 and it is available online. How's that sound? We'll talk about that shortly. Looking down the page, what I'm training you to do is to look down the guide and browse because all of those records have validity so I'm teaching you on how to engage with that material. So firstly, after you've browsed the content, look at the dates of coverage. Now if your person was in the fire brigades in that period, that becomes very interesting to you and then I would recommend you look at the content to see if it's going to be interesting to you after you read that. These circulars include appointments, transfers, leave and notices of death. So that one's a little bit removed, it's not really a career record, but if your person had a long career in the um, fire brigades, you might find it interesting and certainly any historian looking at the at staffing matters, you know, um, all sorts of things, how much leave was given or transfers, appointments, who moved here, who moved where, if you're looking at it more globally it's even more interesting than that. So my main message to you on this screen is to look at the dates of coverage and the content. But let's dive in, these are the series that I've noted as I think the most interesting for the webinar, there's a, a number of others that you would look at, but what you've got in front of you are the examples I'm going to use and they are a little bit of everything, so you'll see a lot of different types of records. So let's dive in, personal record books, don't forget you can read the descriptions of the series as well, also well written, they provide information including the format that the records are in, I look there I see a lot of boxes, I see microfiche copies and I know where to find them. Now if you go into online indexes for this topic, P for occupations, professions and occupations, we go down the page, fire commissioners personnel, we can now look in the index and again information about the index but I, I won't harp, search the index and we now look for someone who's got a really interesting name, a name that will stand out. The one I came up with was Augustus Gerard, I love Augustus as a name, it's a name that thinks forward, that aims up. So we'll look at Augustus's record, it's also a good one for the webinar because it seems to me he's, he had a quite a lengthy career. So we click on details, there's no icon here means it's not digitised, it's on FISH 2055. Now when I said you can find it online, I meant the indexes are online, the actual fiche for the series are in the reading room and this is an example of a scan from one of our really powerful scanners in the reading room, it can even do nine screens quite comfortably, but we're going to of course aim up and see John Gerard, August, Augustus John Gerard and there's his career information right there. Now we're going to look at every bit of this because it's fascinating and I want you to see the payoff if you decide to come in and have a look, it tells us where he was born, it tells you his height, 5 foot 6 inches, it tells you his previous occupation, seaman, his appointments and promotions, it says he's single then later on someone's marked in married and he has one daughter. So already for family historians you're going great, very deeply into his story but it has so much more detail, in fact I think this might be the most detailed career card I've ever seen. Um, it's the type of card it is because it covers everything so thoroughly, it tells you when you join the brigade. Now removed to is the old fashioned way of saying transferred, okay so there's a series of movements, I saw Diamond Host in the list there, promoted to first class, awarded one good service badge, awarded long service and good conduct medal and second good service badge, promoted to the rank of station officer, that was in tw after 23 years of service, awarded Bard a long service medal as from the 21st to the 2nd 1920 and that's where the story ends. Now what's interesting is on the back flip of this um, card you have office offences and awards, I thought I'd, I'd emphasise this because he had a long career and a successful career but it wasn't like it was it wasn't any errors along the way, little blips on the radar or any little things not working and, but what I find interesting when we look down to this kind of level is we're now looking at it from th through the fire brigade's point of view. So when you see the sorts of things that get put on his career record, you see what the focus of the fire brigade was. 
And I think that's something that's quite interesting because it talks about the, the agency as well as about the person involved. Now, the first one is absconding without leave, failing to produce his benefit society book when called upon, allowing the boiler of the MM semen to become short of water. That one sounds quite dangerous. Uh, absconding without leave, disobedience of orders on the 14th of the 4th, 1905, becoming informal on benefit lodge book, Neglect of duty on te allowing telephone fire alarms to catch the station to get in a very dirty and neglected state. Re reprimanded, warned that unless an improvement is made, he would be recommended for a reduction in rank. That was in 1914. He goes on for the next six years, he gets promoted. So that's interesting too. So as you can see, he's had a quite a long end career. Now he's gonna be featured in the next record I found. So. And I wanted, and it's quite unusual. So I've put two series descriptions on left and right. On the left hand side, we can see it's a list of permanent officers and men killed at fires. And on the right, it's a list of major important fires for the Sydney Fire District. And as you're being trained by um, your host, you will look at the years of coverage, but they're quite good, aren't they? 1886 to 1963 and 1840 to 1969, which makes it a really good thing to, to know about. So we'll go into the record. Oh, notice that they're in the same book. This is, does happen in the archives. It just doesn't happen very often. You get one book, you've got two series. <clears throat> now this is the, the list of people killed. That's how many are killed in that time frame. And we can find our man right there. He, was, he died on service in 61, not long after that last entry on his career record. It also tells us, I just thought I'd keep going a bit further, that he was killed in the Elliott Brothers fire of 3rd of the 16th, 1920. Now this book has all the major fires and it turns out, there it is, the chemical works. And I'd imagine that's an extremely dangerous type of fire, not that I'm a fire background myself, I'm an archivist and a historian. I also notice when I'm looking at it, that there's three fires at that venue over the 50 odd year period of, this, of these records. So that's, that. you see how that draws out a lot of information. We know where he died, we know how roughly how he died, we know um, the date he died, and we know um, other fires at the same location. So it was a very dangerous place. Permanent Great Brigade fires for now. Now these are, a little, are more administration than anything. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to the people who find it interesting or to maybe find their records of their person in different promotions. Like we could go through and look for Mr. Gerard's. Promotions, good service badges, murder driving, which is an important feature of the fire brigades in, in the areas that we have records. Um, smoke appliances. Confirmation of appointments, promotions, badges and licenses and you'll leave. So you can see it's an admin record. I just have to move on the Go webinar on my screen occasionally, that's why there's a poor. And you'll leave. And fire reports. So this is like a background administration record. So when you do decide to do research, if you decide to do research on this field, um, you now know what they look like and what the payoff can be. Now, what I also found in the, those records was this, um, and it's, I, I put it in it because it's an example of more detail that you can get from records, and I'm calling it the Collins file. Now, it's a bit of a story and a bit of a drama, and so I'm just gonna give you the facts. You be the judge, you be the, uh, the person who, who makes this historical assessment. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is that sometimes you can flesh out details from these records that you didn't know were there. I call them hidden gems. Now on the 7th of July, first class coachman Jay Collins applies for instruction in a motor car. Okay, so this is the record that we're looking at. And I'm gonna put that to the side. And what he actually says in there is, in consequence of substitute motor hose damage number four being attached to this station, I hereby make an application for tuition in such appliance. So he's asked to be taught how to drive the new um, motor fire engines on the 7th of July. Now. This document we've got in front of us now is on the 17th, on the 27th of the 7th. And it says on the 7th, applications were invited for the position of officer in charge of Bexley in consequence of first class coachman Jay Collins not qualifying for the position. So something's going on right here. On the 21st of July, a communication exhibit one, I just bounced it through too quickly, um, 
was received and it was considered impertinence. Now you decide for yourself. He says, as I'm present occupying the, that position and have not tendered my resignation, it's such, it's not the case. I fail to understand why such an action has been taken. He's quite flabbergasted. If you read the whole letter, he's quite flabbergasted that what, I'm, what are, I've been in the position for a long time, what's going on? And at present, I have not received an answer to my application. I followed customary procedure and naturally expected the department would do the same. And at present, I have not received an answer to my application. My wife teaches me not to read tone in, in messages, but there is a tone, I think, in this one. He's quite flabbergasted and dismayed, and he's showing a, quite a bit of displeasure. And if we go back to the department's policy, they actually called it impertinence. So this is the outcome to the letter. And it all stemmed from that, that application to learn to drive a car. Um, recommended that fire, Fireman A. Wyndham of 21 Station Cogra be appointed officer in charge of Bexley and that first class coachman Collins removed to Cogra. So for some, they've decided because of his impertinence, he's gonna move. But notice this, there's a little bit of a dig at the end. In this connection, it is pointed out that there are horses at Cogra and Collins can be utilized to the best advantage of the brigade. So there it ends. Some, there's some sort of a, a drama happened in these documents that you can see borne out and I hope I gave it justice. Um, but the, if you do go into sort of these sorts of records, you can find these sorts of things. And if you don't know they're there, and if they're not, if they're not, we don't know they're there at this time, they are gems, and there are gems all through the collection, all through. We now go to the more the, the more standard things, um, long service medal and bar register. And I'm just going to do a bit of show and telly in this state part of the webinar. So at the top, you've got the medal for 15 years service. So it gives you the name, the station the date appointed and the board's approval, the date presented. And if you look on the right hand side, this one is actually indexed like an old phone book, which I think dates me by the way. So please ignore I just said that, but you can you can actually come go to the different stations of the book and turn it open and go to that spot. And the book was quite big, uh, something I want to demonstrate with, that, with the words in the sense that it had all the readers of New South Wales and every station. So it was quite, comprehensive in that regard. So if you were to go into that series, I'm, I'm very positive that you might find something. Reserve Corps Register, Board of Fire Commissioners, 939 to 955. This one is, they provide very similar information with a few subtle differences. Date appointed, name, date of birth, occupation, and also remarks. Now this, in, I, I put the mark on the, the resign, so you get extra information if there's remarks. Um, people oftentimes ask me in the reading room if there's remarks and it refers to follow on numbers. Um, do we have those follow on numbers? And the answer is generally speaking, no, it will be a, depend from case to case. Retirement file. Now this is quite a simple one. Um, everyone, there was a rule in the general public service, I believe at the time, and certainly it was made officially a rule for the fire brigades that at the age of 60, you have to retire and you're directed to retire. And so these days, that's um, a, a hope and a dream that that would happen. Now we go to the, the listings and you can see everybody who turned 60 in 1974 and 1975. They're down the page with their date of birth. What fascinated me when I was looking at this record is the line through the name. Now, I, I reckoned that might mean that they've passed. And so what I did is I tried to connect a handful of them to death certificates and in the end I wasn't able to. If they died inside the last 30 years, I won't find them. So it ended up being just a little bit elusive. And I'm gonna let that be something for you to ponder. Why do you think those lines are through those names? Am I right that it's they died? It's hard to say. I, I did my best and unfortunately, there was no outcome on this occasion. I looked at it for about three or four. It was not a major focus, of course. The registers of volunteer fire staff attached to country brigades, 1947 to 1990. Oh, please understand with that one. The uh, 1990 is in the close period of the last 50 years. But moving on, uh, the majority of the records are in the open period and they've got the same things. Name, this kind of case address, occupation, date of appointment, date of birth, um, date um, applied and awards. And then um, remarks as well, which gives you resignation. So uh, we're now, once we go into the registers, they are very, very similar. Volunteer staff in orders, notice it's volunteer staff. They're almost exactly the same to the 
in orders that I showed you before, as you can see. I, I won't um, overemphasize the same point. You get some documents, like on the right-hand side, which are reports, and the usual things on the left-hand side, appointments and so forth. Register of volunteer fire staff attached to metropolitan brigades. Same thing, name, address, occupation, date of appointment, date of birth, date applied, and also awards and remarks. I didn't uh, mark the remarks. New South Wales Fire Brigade Register of Signatures. I, I thought about this one and I thought, I wonder if they'll be interested in this. And I'll leave it to the eye of the beholder. Do you find this a, an interesting thing or not? But there is actually a register of signatures. Now we'll just go back. We're going to double check the coverage, 1884 to 1955, which makes it a significant record. For it'll it'll have value for a lot of people. So it's literally a list of their signatures. Now, if that's interesting to you, this is one way you can get them. It's very unusual to have signatures as records. You can find signatures on records, but a signature of records of people who are employed is there's, there might be others, but there's not a lot of them. Now, the last thing to emphasise is you can look at annual reports online on opengov.newsouthwales.gov.au. I just searched using annual for annual report and fire brigades board, and this is an example of what you can find. In this case, we've got a list of firemen and their date of joining the force in that year that I just found. So for the, if oftentimes, if you can't find a career card and if you can't find, and you find that it's difficult to find them in the registers for some reason, this is another option. I would regard it as probably a second best option. Now we're going to talk, feed the, the, uh, the major fire concepts for the, for the historians and the fascinateds and possibly the family historians moving over. There's a, a wide, it's a variety of records that are available on this. We've got list of important fires, which is the important one. Look at the dates of coverage, 1840 to 969. We have New South Wales cutting books, which is newspaper, literally newspapers cut out and put into a book. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Files on major fires, which is a very important series, and more another one on newspaper cuttings. We'll look at files on major fires first. Now this is an example of an uh, item listing that we hold in the reading room and at a future time they're going to be um, inserted on the website in PDF form at the top of the page when you look at the series. So this is a, a really something get, I want you to get used to because you're going to do this, be able to do this from home very, very soon and you can certainly do it in the reading room. Now what you can do if you're looking for a major fire, you would need a date of the fire which is very easy to find in Trove. Then you would go to the box that matches the year and bingo, you, you can go straight to the fire, provided they made a record in this series. So that's because it's major fires, it's going to be some sort of a definition of what a major fire is. But I think I think we can use a layman's um, answer for that. Um, big buildings, for example, so it seems to be the trend. And I'll show you one example so you can get a little bit of an idea of the kinds of things that we we can uh, find in the major fires. They go into incredible detail. Now this is the Hudson Timber Yard, um, which is which is uh, somewhere near Piemont, yeah, near the Piemont Bridge Road. And here, also, if we go back to the um, list of important fires, it's there. Hudson Timber Yards. Now newspaper cuttings are literally this: um, newspaper articles about the fire and pub put into a book, and. Sometimes I feel the records are speaking to us a story. And in this case, this agency, the fire brigades and the, and the boards that ran the fire brigades, obviously valued how they were portrayed and how it, things were portrayed in the, in, the, in the media. And I would imagine that would still be the case today, although cutting newspaper articles out and pasting them in a book is probably not the go anymore. But I find it interesting because it tells me they're, they're, what they valued and what they found important and I imagine it's when the, we're talking about an accountable government agency, they want to know that they're, they're being perceived to do a good job. I, these are my thoughts, um, but I think it's open to interpretation. Some of the images too are quite remarkable. Now the report on the fire comes through as a series of um, charges that were then addressed. And I've capitalised where they've capitalised, failing to order on the fire float immediately, knowing that it was a waterfront fire, and it says not sustained and gives a reason. Charge two, I, I jumped because of um, time, that he and the deputy chief officer left the fire without leaving a senior officer in charge, 
and leaving the whole of the responsibility of this fire to a young officer when older and more experienced officers were available, neither charge sustained. And the charge four was sending most of the engines away as well as the fire floats without the fire being properly under control. So these are quite heavy charges. Now at the moment, this is the first one where there's um, a level of sustaining of the, uh, the charge. Mr. Nens admits the error of judgment in sending the fire floats away, but the facts do not call for a disciplinary action, which is interesting. There's, there's much more detail than obviously I can, I can portray. I'm trying to give you the sense of how deep they are. The conflict of opinion between Chief Officer Jackson and Assistant Chief Officer Nance as to whether it was the duty of the operator or the senior officer in charge at the time to order on the fire plates emphasises the necessity of defining what room duty. So we seem to have here a jurisdictional disagreement and some of the fire floats got ordered away because of it or, or as an outcome. So some quite some serious, serious allegations have been made and have been addressed in this report. And even now, after a hundred years, we can now assess and look at it in hindsight and, and see what the benefit of the, the, the inquiry was. Now, the outcomes is interesting. The statements are suggested there to therein extraneous to the actual fighting of Hudson Fire have no foundation in fact. So it sounds like some of them were very personal. The board also records its disapproval and regret that such statements or suggestions could have been made by its chief officer without reflection or consideration. So I don't know, I, I, what I want you to notice when we go into the report in this highlight form is that they do bring forward all the details of the fire. Um, other reports might go into the details of, um, of the technical stuff of the, whether the wool caught fire or not, how it caught fire, whether the equipment failed or not and so forth. But this one seems to be a jurisdictional report. And we move on. So we'll look at now the smaller fires. These are not major fires, just general fires in city places. These are the places that you'll find records on a board of fire commissioners in police gazettes, newspapers and inquests. I do recommend always looking at the guides and the fire gui guides will give you a sense of what we have. I'm not um, gonna emphasize all of them. I think it should be a little bit of a homework if you're curious, go and have a look at the guide. List of important fires for the Sydney district. There's files and major fires there. And it, they recommended looking at the Board of Fire Commissioners, so we'll do that. Now, the agency was in place for 1910 to 1989. We go down to the bottom of the page and set, click See All Series. We get a list of everything we hold under the agency that has been registered into the system. And the policies of the archive at the current time is that we, we upload into, onto the website as soon as we possibly can. There's no, the tale is as short as it can possibly be. And now for your point of view, you're looking through what might be every record we have on the subject. On this subject, it hasn't moved greatly to my knowledge. So this is everything we have. And if you want to find out more about any particular series, just click on it and it will generally give a description. Now the board organised the establishment of subsidised volunteer fire brigades and metropolitan fire brigades and consisted of stations permanently staffed with paid employees. These are the sort of records. You'll notice there's overlap there. There's uh, fire registers for the Sydney areas, fire registers for the country areas, fire record books and, and files relating to fires outside of the district areas. So looking through those, these, this is an example of what they look like. Date and time. Um, just excuse me for the pause. I'm moving the GoWebinar software around and I can't see the writing. Locality, occupier and name of business and owner of premises. So that's quite a, a decent amount of information. On the other side, it provides ex who extinguished it exactly and how. Uh, appliances, which is the fire ex uh, engines and so forth, men from volunteer stations and the damage that was made. So you, you get quite a good coverage with these records. The fire record books are very, very similar and date and time, locality, occupier, damage and attendance, the amount of number of people who attended. And we've also hold station records. And so to look for a station, just write Dubbo Fire Station, as I have here in the, in the search engines, it'll direct you to the agency. And as, I'm, as one of my features today, I'm suggesting you look at the agency, 
feel free to read the description. It tells you what sort of records we have. And it turns out we go down to two types of records for Dubbo, occurrence books and fire record books. Now this is going to show you the current books. Well, I'll show you, I'll show you. It's best just to show you these things. Each occurrence within the station, including staffing summaries. I noticed there's some money spent and so forth. Occurrence books, a little bit more the stock uh, fire record that we've seen, date and time, locality, supposed cause, damage, and attendance as well. I didn't highlight those, obviously. You can find things with newspapers, which I've already mentioned. You can find information on death certificates, court records, police gazettes, and inquest records. So we'll emphasize those just a little bit here. The keyword arson will bring forward lots of things that you're looking for, if you're looking for that kind of a record. Um, in this case, picked completely at random because it's the first one there. We, we have a record there. So this is a good search term. And this topic is really user friendly because you've got fires, you've got arson, you've got fire, bushfire, you've got all these keywords that I think will stand out among other records. This is the view from Dubbo station. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a photo of the station. Now inquests are very important on the subject of fire and they go into incredible detail. So I'm going to show you the highlights of a very detailed inquest into fire. Um, the inquest was very thick, something like um, 18 to 20 centimetres thick when I went through it. And I used the research technique of, of looking at dates in trove to pick out the key moments of the, of the inquest. And then I went to those dates and found the records. So, Interesting example of how to use two different ways of searching, combining to get an outcome. Now in the event, the thing about the, the um, inquest is, in the event of destruction of any property, real or personal by fire, the coroner has jurisdiction to inquire into the cause and origin of such fire. Um, something that we're aware of as archivists, if you go and look at the old card indexes of the fire brigade, of the, excuse me, the coroner's court now, of the coroner's courts, they have, it's alphabetical by list of the name of person who died, and then they have a section called fires. So any fire inquest will be under the section called fires. So it doesn't have to be a death. It can be just into the cause of the fire. This is an example that you can look for these sorts of things in Trove. Um, this is in the police gazettes because they may also have mention of the inquests. You also can look for inquests into um, on the in, on ancestry. You just click on the New South Wales section, go to the inquests and then you can search by fire. The first one picked completely at random because it's first, and you get where it was held. It's outcome, destroyed by fire, no evidence to show how it originated. And on our website, we've now got inquests perfectly um, in, uploaded and indexed. So you can sort, search for your uh, fire inquest by location. I'm now looking to see who torched the torch, the torch newspaper inquest. Now there's two, it's two references to the same matter. So we're going to now look at that file. Now, just a little bit of background. This is the Torch newspaper's um, local paper for Bankstown. And the man who was the editor at the time of it burning down was Philip Inched. Now, this is from the inquest file. And, and, and with this part of the talk, I want to show you how much detail you can get when you do get a fire inquest into something substantial like a big um, uh, newspaper. So he was actually working in the office. Okay, now he wasn't there on the site at the time of the fire in, the, in 1955. Now what we've got is there's some sort of alleged sabotage of the, of the newspaper by, theoretically, by a local paper rival. And you can sometimes find um, evidence of inquests in the trove. On this subject, this is the file I was talking about, the 400 page file. I went through the whole trial on trove and then went through the records to match what I'd read. And it's, so that's a technique for making short work of a very huge file and still getting to the point where you learn things. It gives you quite a lot of details in newspapers, but of course it is a filtered source. Um, they're going with the information they have at the time. I do notice though, they misspelled Mr. Inks' name. Just thought I'd mention that as an ex-school teacher. Now what's interesting is photographs. When you have inquests, you get photographs and photographs tell a story. They do tell a thousand words, I believe that. In this case, we're going to walk in with the photographer because he's coming down this sideway, which with, by the way, rent a crowd. Why are all these people coming down to see the building? 
Anyway, uh, we walk in, it just turn right, turn left again, and we can see the premises of what must have been a small local newspaper, completely torched. We go back to the um, plan, and the photographs are actually linked to location. And so I can walk you through the building now. This is the switchboard in front offices. Up in the right-hand corner, Shells to right, Swain's building in the middle distance. Gives us location. I think we can say it's a complete destruction. We go to the printing room, clearly destroyed. And then we come across this. This is a little intriguing thing. This is concrete, and there's some sort of a mark on the concrete, holes in the cement floor. So I'll leave it to your imaginations what you think that might be, but that's got something to do with it, don't you think? It's, it's the only record we've seen so far that actually suggests a story. So we'll look into that one. Now, the, it is a large document, but they did interview the Raymond Kelly, the investigating officer, and he said a few things that I think I'll just draw forward for the sake of the story. I formed the opinion that the fire had been caused by a vapor explosion and that it had been maliciously lit. Now, in other places, particularly in the newspapers, they actually called um, the vapor explosion a Molotov cocktail. They think a Molotov cocktail was thrown through the window and they think that that mark on the concrete was where it exploded. What's interesting, so they think it happened in the middle of the floor, it was probably tossed in through a window, took over the printing room and then the premises. Now, do you suspect anybody? And he replied, yes, I respect, I, I suspect Jack and Ray Fitzpatrick. Now, Jack and Ray Fitzpatrick actually ran a local newspaper as well. And I think this was a feud over, over the local area and who controlled the local area. Now, this is interesting. Last night, Ray Fitzpatrick, Esk Mayor Alderman Blanche Burkell and ex-Alderman Byers were all at the fire while the fire was burning and they were all laughing. Pretty damning evidence right there. Now in the newspapers, he denies everything Fitzpatrick. Sorry, that is the best image I could find for you. Um, he knows nothing of the, torch, of the torch fire. Now the findings, which is another feature of inquests, the said property was destroyed by fire on the 11th day of April, 1955, but how the fire originated, whether accidental or otherwise, the evidence adduced does not enable me to say. I find that startling after the, the, the laughing at the scene of the crime sort of comment and, and there's a lot of other evidence of a feud going back many many years but what i've also noticed is that i've now given you a few examples of um, these sorts of things and and we don't ever seem to get to an outcome in these sorts of cases so it's it's quite a murky subject um the inquest into fires we'll switch to bushfires because some of you may be curious and interested in that element of the fire um, records and we can search by collection search. Inquests will cover those sorts of fires as well. Um, there's the Bushfire Committee, Minutes and Correspondence. There's a the special bundles Ray bushfires under the pressure Premier's Department. What you'll find with departments um, such as Premier's is that they have um, correspondence coming in and out, but when it's all on one subject and it's obviously each letter refers to the other letters and it's all a subject, they call it a special bundle. They create a bundle which might be well, in this case, the first one is the Royal Commission on Bushfires, 1921 to 1929, and it, it's in one spot, and in our collection, it's in one spot in our collection. So you can actually get out the whole bundle and read the whole thing if you want to. To find things like that, search by bushfires. It will work. It'll provide, I think, a very, very, very wide range of um, outcomes. But as per always, I'm training you to browse the results, check the years of coverage, that it's what you're looking for, the locations, and then click on the item to see if you like what you're seeing, and then you're in a position to order it in the reading room or not. This is from the minutes of and correspondence of the Board of Fire Commissioners. Minutes are very good ways of working out what agencies are doing. And without going into great detail, we're coming near the end of the talk. There's a regulation in existence which prohibits absolutely for the present, the lighting of fires out of doors. How um, reminiscent of today is that? The instance of this regulation was possibly not noted when it was being framed, but it has resulted in the accumulation of litter and rubbish on private and public property. Where have I heard that before? This one is from 1945. Let us receive special bundles. I found this interesting one from 1927. The attention of owners and occupiers of lands drawing the railway lines, drawn to the importance of systematically burning off grass and providing efficient fire breaks on lands drawing the railway lines with a view to prevention of bushfires. 
this particular Royal Commission, I believe the issue was that there were they, the, the, the trains had something to do with the fires going away from the railway lines. So either it was the sparking of the um, locomotives or was people th throwing out matches out the window, you know, after they lit their cigarettes, that kind of thing. So it's is relation to the railways. Um, this is a notice of burning off operations sign. What I found interesting as I went through this file is they actually had designs for, for boilers that won't create sparks that cause fire. So the blueprints are actually kind of fascinating. This is interesting too. Um, it's just a, a letter with a, a suggestion of an advert. Now they got into the nitty gritty on this one. It turns out this is what one of those matches that you could strike on your shirt and, and you could start it up. So it, it could start very easily at the wrong time and create a fire. It's actually quite dangerous. But the they keep mentioning, they actually read that, uh, we don't think much of it. The illustration represents not a wax vesta, but a wooden match. Now the wax vesta, I had to Google this, I did not know. The wax vesta is the type of match which will only um, be struck if it goes against the thing that it's created in. So inside a metal box, we now essentially use something very similar because it can only be struck against one of the sides of the box. And so they, they criticise that it's the wrong type of match for the advertising. And yeah, interesting. So you get all sorts of views on these kinds of documents, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes indifferent, and sometimes statistics. Fires created by carelessness are highlighted to the left. Trains as well, tractors, motor vehicles, and so forth, lightning. So if you're a historian of bushfires or you wanted to compare past bushfires to the present, you can do that through the special bundles and Royal Commissions as well. I thought I'd finish this section of the talk with um, the Government Printing Office control, fire control map because it's a feature of all the fires that we face in modern times as well. Times may change, uh, how, but how much do they stay the same? Now, if you wanted to go through the agencies, there is actually a trial that goes through to the modern rural bushfires um, agency. The bushfire committee was, seems to be the first under the 1949 Bushfire Brigades Act, and they manage fires in areas not proclaimed by the District of Fire Brigades Act. So that basically means in the bush. And if you go to the bottom, you can see we have papers relating to the establishment of the committee and minutes and correspondence. So if you're looking at history, that's two very strong options. If we hit the succeeding agency, we can see who came next. Turns out it's the Bushfire Council from 1970 to 1977. And following on from that is New South Wales Rural Fire Service, which is now the current body. I didn't go down to records we hold for that, but I wouldn't imagine it'd be very many. Um, one of the things when you get into current times is they're actually closed to public access. So they're less likely to be here and less likely to be described on the website until they're available for access. The last thing on my webinar, finding photographs of fires. These are some of the sources of fires that we have, that many of which I've mentioned already. Now you notice the first one is NRS 15454. Here's a little trick for you if you don't have it already. You can just write it into our series and search by series number and it brings you straight to the record. We do the usual thing that I've been teaching you. We go to the bottom and we see all items and bingo, we now have a list of all the records we have under that agency, under that series. Now, if there's a thumbnail, it means it's digitally available. And if there's no thumbnail, you have to access it in the reading room. This series is not well scanned at the moment, but that will change over time. So here's some examples of the images that we can find. That's one of the commissioners. Um, by the way, his name is Nicholas George Sparks. I just thought I'd mention that. And finally, search by fire. You can find all sorts of results. What I'd recommend is if you do a general search that brings up so many things you don't know where to start, click digitally available, it'll list photographs. Now there's a little bit of overlap here. I noticed there's a ship called the Fire Queen, but that's just a bit of bad luck. It'll, it'll bring forward all the photos we have on fire quite well. This is the, one of them, a little bit washed out. And in this section of the webinar, I'm gonna trail off into just letting you see the scope and the power of photographs.
This is now the final part of my presentation. Um, it's a composite photograph showing Chief Officers of New South Wales Fire Brigade. It's actually got another image with it, which I thought I'd finish with. It's this one. Because what's really important is that you have ordinary people there, the Fire Brigade, but you also have a list of names and how that is actually very, very rare. So we know exactly who those gentlemen are. 